Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me today? Okay, great. So this is Janine. I'm just waiting a couple minutes. Well, it should be just shortly here. Vanessa will be presenting today and she'll be joining. I apologize for the delay. If you guys have questions as we go through, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat. There's also a question and answer area, so you can use that as well. And once Vanessa gets started, she'll give you a little bit more information on how everything will go today. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, Vanessa, I just let everyone know that you would be joining in just a minute. And I told them that you'll want, I told them about the chat box and the question and answer. Um, he's on Zoom, so they can type anything in there that they want as you present. And then I said, if there's anything else you want to go over before we get started, that you would do that once you joined. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Janine. You're welcome. Let me just pull up the slides here. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. I haven't seen anyone else respond, but I would believe that they probably all can too. All right. Yes, they can. Great, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining today. Sorry for the slow start here, but um, so today we'll be talking about the components of a quantitative methodology chapter. Um, and as Janine said, feel free to use the chat feature um, or to call out if you can um, with any questions as we go along. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to share some resources with you in case anybody is interested on receiving more personalized um, help or assistance with any projects that they have going on. So we do provide um, assistance with all aspects of the dissertation. So if you're interested in more one-on-one -on -one support, please feel free to use any of the information on this slide to contact us and learn more about the services that we provide. Okay, so today we'll be talking about the quantitative methodology, what methodology chapter. Um, we won't be talking about qualitative methods today, but we do have another webinar available to review those if anyone's interested. Um, so please check out our upcoming webinar schedule as well. 
Today we'll be talking about the purpose of the methods chapter and the different components that are required for it. Um, as outlined on this slide here. And then at the end of the presentation, I will open the floor for some Q&A. So the earlier chapters leading up to the methods chapter, like the introduction and literature review chapters, are designed to establish why you're going to be conducting your research. There, you're gonna be painting a picture for your reader on why your research needs to be conducted, why it's important, um, and where there are gaps in the literature that is kind of leading towards um, the need for your project. So once you arrive to your methods chapter, now you're going to be describing the how. So how are you going to be conducting your data, um, your research, how you're going to be collecting data, um, how you're going to be analyzing it, all in order to answer the questions that you have already set forth in those previous chapters. So here, the important thing to keep in mind um, is that it should have enough detail to where someone can read your paper and then go on to reproduce your research in the exact same way that you've described. So this is very similar to kind of writing like an instruction manual or a recipe. You wanna be as detailed as possible. I also want to note that each school may have varying um, guidelines on exactly what needs to go into the methods chapter. So I just recommend that you check with your schools and defer to their requirements as you're pulling this chapter together. Okay. So in the introduction, you're wanting to reorient your reader to the purpose of your study and your research questions. So this can be done by restating the study purpose or the problem statement, um, stating the research questions or hypothesis again, or outlining the sections um, that are to come throughout your paper. So one thing to make sure of here is that when you are reminding your reader of your research questions or your hypothesis, you're using the exact same wording. So there's no ambiguity with your research questions and it's very clear and consistent throughout the paper. Okay, one of the first things that you will talk about in this chapter is why you selected your research design and the general research method that you'll be using. So in this case, the general research method that we're discussing is going to be quantitative um, as opposed to a qualitative or a mixed method study. So once you've described your general method, you will then go on to describe the research designs within that framework stating the specific design that you're going to use. So again, for this case, it would be the specific quantitative design. So that can be something like a correlational study, experimental, or quasi-experimental, or any other quantitative methods that you have in your toolbox. To explain why you selected a specific research design, you should be working to align the language with the problem, purpose, and research question that you've already discussed throughout your paper. So for example, if you want to examine relationships between um, coworkers or relationships between like a mother infant dyad or something like that, you may select a correlational design because given the nature of a correlational design, it would be appropriate for that type of study. So in addition to explaining why you selected a specific design, you also want to explain why alternative research designs were not selected. So again, going with the correlational design, you may want to explain why um, an experimental design wouldn't work with that study. So you might say something like, it would be impossible for you to manipulate any independent variables in the relationships, making that study design not feasible. So here you just really want to paint the picture for why the design you are using is the most appropriate and feasible design for your research question. Okay, now when you're getting to the section that you're talking about your population, it's important here to really distinguish and just for yourself to really have a clear understanding of your population versus your sample. So the population is describing the entire group that you want to draw conclusions about and the sample is just the specific group that you will be collecting data from. 
Um, so a good way to remember this is just to think of the sample as always being a smaller version of your population. So for example, if you're hoping to um, draw conclusions regarding pregnant women, in your dissertation, you are definitely constrained in time and resources. So you're not going to be able to you know, study all pregnant women, but you might be able to access a clinic in your, in your area and be able to work in that local clinic. So your population might go from being pregnant women to a sample of 30 pregnant women in a clinic in Miami-Dade County, for example. So just making sure you've got a really good understanding of kind of that ice cream cone method to getting down to what the sample is and distinguishing it from the population. Um, in this section, this is a good place to provide general characteristics and statistics about the population. So what you already know, um, what are some challenges that population faces, what percentage of that population deals with whatever you're talking about. So really just getting down to some of those general statistics. And you'll also want to describe the procedures or techniques that you'll be following to identify um, the different individuals from that population and to invite them to complete your study. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. The sampling strategies that are um, pretty general are probability or non-probability sampling. So here you'll just want to determine what the most appropriate and feasible way for you to conduct your study is and then just describe it to your reader. Here you'll also want to talk about recruitment methods and uh, really detail how you're going to be advertising your study. Will this be through flyers, um, Facebook ads, word of mouth? How are people going to hear about your study? And then um, how will you actually be reaching out to the participants once they've heard about it? So if you do have a flyer, is there maybe a QR code on that flyer to a pre-screening survey that will determine whether or not they're eligible, and then talk about how you're going to be following up with those participants. So you might be calling them and then confirming their eligibility criteria before enrolling them in a study. So here's just where you'll outline some of those details. I won't go too much into um, power analysis in this presentation. Um, because we do have others that are focused on both power analysis and sample size calculation. So if you do have specific questions on those, I'll direct you to those specific webinars. So next you're gonna wanna talk about, oh, sorry, skip the slide. Next you're gonna wanna talk about the instrumentation so in this section, you'll want to lay out and describe each of the instruments that you'll be using to measure each variable um, that's laid out in your research question or your hypotheses. So there are a lot of different kinds of instruments that can be used depending on the specific variables that you're looking at. Usually in the social sciences, when we think of instruments, we think of survey instruments. So maybe you're measuring something like self-efficacy or self-esteem, or maybe you're doing a psychological study or measuring something like anxiety or depression. So in those cases, you might wanna give participants a survey that they fill out to measure those types of constructs. So that can be something like the Beck depression scale, um, something like that. Um, and in those cases, those will kind of, those will kind of form, you know, that construct that you're that you're trying to get at. Um, but there's other types of instrumentation as well. So if you're doing a study that's more biomedical, then you may want to take physical measurements like height and weight, or maybe even take um, vital signs like blood pressure or collect specimens. So those are just some types of instruments that you can be using in your study. But generally, in this section, you'll want to provide a detail on who created the instrument, if you are using an already existing um, survey instrument, how many items are in it, how participants can answer the questions. So that can be anything like they're using a Likert scale, or maybe it's a yes, no survey. So you really wanna detail what those response options look like. Um, and then you'll also wanna talk about how the survey is scored. So talking about 
you know, is a high sum score related to higher levels of depression or is a lower sum score, just really paint the picture for what that looks like and what the scores mean. Here, you'll also want to provide information on the, valid the validity of instruments and information on how it was created and developed. So for validity, you would usually present information from different factor analyses that the researcher did to establish the validity of the instrument in the first place. And then for reliability, you would usually um, use something like convex alpha or correlations for test, uh, retest reliability or something similar to that. But here's where you'll provide um, the statistics and the evidence from the original research to establish that these instruments have been you know, well vetted and, and they'll be good for your study. It's also important here to note uh, with everything, I guess, that different schools have um, sometimes different processes for documenting this. So just make sure again that you're referring back to your university and that you're providing all the information that they require. Okay, so now you've outlined why your research is important, um, how you're going to do it, and what measures you're gonna be using. And now you're gonna to need to talk about your data collection procedures. So here you'll wanna start from beginning to end, the procedures that you're gonna to follow to collect your data. So again, you wanna make sure that you are detailed enough so that someone can repeat this. So you don't wanna skip any steps. So we recommend starting right from the beginning. So going through that IRB approval process and then the following next steps that you're gonna be taking to conduct your project. All the way up through um, when your data is completely collected and ready to analyze. So really not leaving anything out. You'll wanna be as detailed as possible. So for example, you wanna provide information about the modality. So are you going to be collecting your data in person, um, maybe through a paper pen survey, or will it be collected online, maybe through REDCap or um, Qualtrics? Also, you'll wanna talk about the order of the instruments that will be, being, that will be collected. Oh, sorry, I see something in the chat here. Janine, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Someone else wrote in and said they couldn't hear. Can anyone, can everyone hear the presentation? Okay, we, we got a yes. All right, it looks like some other people can hear. So I just need to adjust the audio on your end. Perfect. Um, so just getting back into it. Um, so here you'll want to also go into the order of the instruments. So if you are providing or are you, if you are taking various surveys, maybe you're collecting a demographic survey and then you're going to collect information on your um, variable of interest, whether that be, again, I'll go with the example of depression. So maybe next you have the depression score. Um, followed by some other scores. You just wanna really detail the order of those. Um, and then if you are going to be doing a longitudinal study, here's where you'll want to outline the different time points uh, when participants are filling out surveys. So painting a really clear timeline of when each data point is being collected and what's being collected at each data point. Now, if you're doing a survey that involves secondary data, then your data collection procedure section will look a little bit different as opposed to primary data collection. If you're using archival data, you'll want to describe more of the process for how you're going to obtain the data rather than the process for how the data are collected. So for instance, maybe the data that you're using is managed by um, the CDC or some organization and you need to then collaborate with them to get permission for access. So in that case, you will be detailing all of the things that you did to gain permission and to acquire the data um, as opposed to what I've described already. So just one thing to note if you're doing secondary versus primary um, data. Okay, 
Next, you're going to describe what you're going to be doing with this data. So how you're going to analyze it. You'll want to start by talking about the procedure for storing the data. So you may have a password protected Excel file where you're documenting the data, or you may be using um, a data capture system like Redcap. So here's where you'll talk about that and also cite the particular softwares that you're using. Next, you'll want to talk about what software you'll be using for data analysis and cleaning. Um, and you'll want to also describe exactly what you'll be doing to clean the data and how you'll be dealing with any missing responses. So if you've got maybe survey participants who were lost to follow up, never filled out specific instruments or um, questions that weren't required in a survey where people were able to skip through questions, here you'll just want to address um, how you'll be uh, accounting that score or how you're accounting that participant. You may also want to describe how you're going to screen your data for, for any eligibility criteria. So maybe you provided screening questions in your survey. Um, just here thinking about how you're going to use that to potentially eliminate participants who filled out the survey but weren't eligible. So if you are creating instruments, it is really helpful to go ahead and just add a screener at the front end of those surveys. Um, this will help you screen out right at the beginning anybody who might not be eligible for the survey and it might save you some headache later on the data cleaning side. You'll also want to describe any procedures that you'll be doing like recoding or reverse coding any specific instruments um, that will take place in this section as well. And then you'll want to describe any descriptive statistics that you present on your data, like demographic information. Um, and then lastly, you'll want to get into the analysis and answer, you know, how does this particular analysis get to my research question or hypothesis? So you will want a separate analysis or, you know, some kind of differentiation between each research question that you've posed in your paper. And then also this last bullet here, you'll wanna talk about the assumptions for the analysis. So for example, if you're doing a t-test, you know, there are some assumptions like um, normality or homogeneity of variance. So you're gonna to wanna to talk about how are you testing those elements in your study? And then how will you address if those elements are not met? So if normality isn't met, you know, what are you doing in order to continue going forward with that particular um, method? Okay. So next, you're going to want to discuss the limitations of your study. Um, so kind of getting back to that um, assumptions piece, not every um, method of analysis can be used for every study just because they require different assumptions. So here you may talk about in your study, um, if something wasn't met, for example, how you dealt with that and why that is a limitation to the study. Also, um, thinking about, you know, what conclusions can we draw from this study? So if you are going with a correlational design, we know that just because a correlation exists, that doesn't mean that there's a causal effect. So this is a great place to describe that. You also might want to think about different biases that might be present in your study. So for example, if you are taking a survey of women who've recently given birth, you might notice that recall bias is something that's present. So here you'll just want to be conscious of the different biases that can come from both the participant side and also the researcher side and just outline where they might be present in your study. Um, you also may want to talk about any limitations that you ran into as a researcher. So whether that be, uh, you know, a very common one now is, you know, COVID-19. So if that has impacted your study, maybe in terms of recruitment numbers or your ability to conduct in-person research or in-person um, data collection, this would be a great place to describe that as well. So going along with that, you'll also want to describe the ethical considerations um, 
and this also gets at some of the things that we've talked about already in terms of you know how your data is stored you want to think about um, the different principles uh, you know conducted in the belmont report i'm sure that each of you will have to go through some type of city training in order to conduct your research and get irb approval so just making sure that throughout your methods chapter you've got this in there also so you may want to talk about how the participants are provided informed consent. So that could be over the phone, it could be in person, or it could be that initial page of an online survey. So really outlining how consent is, um, how the study is described to them, and also how the consent is collected. In that consent form, you should be discussing the um, risks of being involved and also the benefits um, to the participant. And then you want to be conscious of how um, how you will be protect, protecting the participant identity. So whether that be through um, de-identifying data or using participant IDs as opposed to participant names, this is an important place to include that as well. And then getting back to that stored that we discussed earlier, you know, whether you're using a password protected file or um, or maybe redacted data and also really thinking about uh, the study team that's involved in looking at the data. So, you know, your data shouldn't be kind of open source for everyone to use, uh, especially if it's not de-identified. So here you'll want to describe who has access to the data, how are they using it, um, and also what are they doing with it or what are you doing with it once it's been analyzed and used, whether that be being destroyed or de-identified or, you know, however you're handling some of those study wrap up procedures. So that does conclude um, the presentation portion. Uh, again, here are some resources and contact information that you can use if you have any questions. But I guess we can open the floor for questions now. Okay, so our first question is, is it acceptable to invite schools to be a part of the research outside of the teacher learning and research departments for various, for various school districts on Facebook? Can a particular school accept the research on their, let's see. So, yeah, Jane, I think it might be helpful to hear a little bit more about what you are envisioning. So I'm going to stop share and I'm going to unmute you. Okay. If, if you're able to speak. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have actually sent out letters to various school districts uh, requesting research and for my study, and uh, I haven't heard back from many, and I understand because of COVID, a lot of people are not in their offices. Mm -hmm. um, so if I were to reach out on Facebook, I think what's going to happen there are a lot of uh, different elementary teachers that are on Facebook. They may respond to saying, yes, it sounds exciting. I'd like to do it. But can they actually accept um, being participants in this research without their teaching and learning or research departments that are usually in within the districts? Right. Yeah, so I've seen, I think there's two things to consider here. So the first is uh, whether or not you have IRB approval for a Facebook type outreach. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that's completely possible. Um, I would say to get that, you would just want to update your recruitment method. So maybe including a, do, were you thinking direct teachers or more like a post that teachers can respond to? I'm hoping direct teachers. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. two ways I'm looking at. If I, I could go through uh, just looking at archival data because I'm certain because of COVID, a lot of the testing techniques 
probably have not been adhered to. Um, but also, if it's possible where I could have um, a face to face with the teachers that I would love to have also. Yeah, so if you've already submitted um, your initial protocol, I'd recommend submitting a mod. Okay. That include, you know, a different recruitment method, whether it be a flyer or a more like direct to teacher method. Okay. But the other hurdle is that, you know, I won't know and you won't know if they'll be permitted to participate unless they're right. district. Yeah, so that's just... Yeah, there's always a protocol and you want to respect that, but um, because I haven't heard and it's been several months since I've actually, you know, sent out my request. So I'm getting a little nervous about that. So, Yeah, that's understandable. Um, yeah, if you'd like, you know, we can discuss this further offline, but I think definitely step one, if you want to pursue a different recruitment method is to just submit that IRB modification um, to make sure you're able to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, um, I'll just share our contact information again. If you do find yourself having questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, or to reach out to me directly. I can put my email address in the chat. And thank you all for attending today. <laughs>